Monica, thank you so, so much for being our January cover girl. Our theme for January 21 is Find Your Joy. Mm. And I personally couldn't think of anyone more suited to this than you. Um, let's get straight in. I'm a big fan of your Pretty Intense podcast. Can you share with us about that, please? Well, um, I guess the idea for the podcast came about a couple of years ago because almost two years ago, not quite, um, because I realized just how much I like to talk. And what I learned, what I learned is that I was going to have to learn to listen. <laughs> um, but I, I love to have conversations with people, I guess is the point. Like I'm very interested in people. I'm um, curious. I always have so many questions for people. Uh, so yeah, I just have a natural curiosity um, to know more. And so that's when sort of the epiphany came where it was like, man, I should have a podcast that makes perfect sense. And so um, selfishly, I, I truly just enjoy doing it because I, I really like meeting all these people. I like talking to them. I like hearing their story. I like learning. I love learning. Um, so, and it's taught me new skill sets, you know, coming from a background of, um, well, since I was about four, so, you know, 20 plus years of doing the talking it was so interesting to learn how to interview versus being interviewed. And of course, the beautiful dynamic of that is, is that um, you learn. You don't learn when you're the one talking. You learn when you're listening. Well, I love that you say that um, because it is a big shift. So two of my favorites of, your, of yours are Harry Mandel and Dr. Joe Dispenza. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Who's been your favorite? And when you talk about learning, what are you learning hmm. through Pretty Intense? Um, well, uh, my favorites are, uh, I do love Joe's. Um, I love his content. Um, I love his um, message, his, what his gift is to the world. Um, I, loved, uh, I loved Zach Bush who talked about, you know, the nature of cancer cells and how they work and how it actually is quite simple. And then the bio, you know, you're sort of like, you know, the biosphere that you live in and that your body is in. Um, I love John Paul DeJoria, who started Paul Mitchell and Patron. He had such beautiful information about just being a boss and being a good human, as well as our conversation took a total turn and we ended up talking about aliens and all kinds <laughs> of really fun stuff. So it's always fun when it sort of takes those turns. Um, and uh, let's see, like Jenny McCarthy was super fun. She's obviously super lively, but she's so vulnerable and she has crazy stories to tell, but is also really smart and um, has a lot of ambition. So, you know, there's been a wide range of people. I'm, I'm not even identifying. I mean, like they've all been so enjoyable. And so I guess at the, at the, at the, at the core of it is that everyone has a story. Like everyone has a story is if you are ready to listen. And also then if you're uh, ready to guide, guide sort of the conversation there and trying to it's all about trying to figure out how to, to get in to the truth, which sometimes you come from the side, sometimes you come in from the back, but it's really about like, how do you sort of like unpack this human on a relatable level that we all experience so that their story can apply. And um, so, you know, just hearing that and hearing what it is that got them to where they're at and what motivated them, their failures and how they overcame it. I mean, that's, that's real life. We can all relate to that stuff. Yeah, it's fascinating to me because, you know, when you actually get in the business of listening and talking to brilliant people like you, um, what you learn, I love Jenny's, by the way. I loved her shirt. That was just real fun. I was like, I want a shirt like that for today. Um, <laughs> but also, um, John Petraria, I've interviewed him before, and it's fascinating. You know, people wouldn't assume someone like that the beginning that they have had and the going door to door selling, you know, encyclopedias out of the back of his trunk. And then to see what he created from that 
is mind blowing. And those are the stories we want to share. So, um, I love, 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 love your podcast. Thank you so much for doing that. I, I can tell that you've really listened to them too, to know that story. I'm super grateful. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think we all need to listen to, to ladies like you right now, especially in these times, um, because the whole dynamic of humanity, and I think we're really sort of seeing it under a microscope right now, um, it's all those nooks and crannies that, that bring us here. And whether it's sort of thinking on an energetic level, so that's one of the reasons, you know, I love that uh, um, Joe Dispenza is, for example, in his recovery process and just thinking about mm. that. And that to me was like, oh gosh, I'm really skimming the surface on, on my energy work. I need to really up my game. You're like, uh, this guy healed his entire body with his mind. <laughs> right? He broke his, I think he broke his back. Like he was, you know, I mean, just to be able to do that. And, you know, the, the other option was a surgery that was very risky, which is why he was like, well, let me just try and see if I can do this with my brain. Right. And I loved, he was so sort of laissez-faire about it. Well, you know, you could go sort of all the way and take the most drastic route, or you could go conservative and build your way along. And what rush was I in? And I just, that to me was really huge because faced with what he was facing at that time and the possibility of never walking again, that he was able to really just master not only his emotions, but his mind, you know, and overcome fear, which um, I think all of us could do with, with a little help with right now. Well, it's, I mean, at the core of it, quite simply, is that, you know, this idea of karma being that if you keep thinking thoughts from the past, they inevitably rainbow over to the future and become your future. So to get beyond that mind that's thinking in the past, you have to truly become more, you have to think greater than where you're at, which means think about what you want and then and put your body into that, into that place where you've actually achieved it. You've got it. You, you, you've, 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 you're in the moment. So um, you truly say you're, say, say you want to go somewhere like, right. And so say you want to go to Paris and you're looking at, you're looking at the Eiffel tower and like, how would you feel knowing that you finally, how would you feel looking at it? And would you feel grateful? And would you feel like in awe and just like gratitude and like joyful and like put your body in that state? Because your mind can't tell the difference between the truth and the lie. It can't tell the difference that it didn't actually happen. And so when you get into his science and that, you know, everything in the quantum exists simultaneously, past, present, and future, you're just accessing a new timeline with other, all the new options. And so, you know, trying to wrap your head around that sort of grand idea that like anything is possible, you know, just putting yourself in that place. And at the very least, you feel better for 10 seconds, right? At the very least. What you're really doing is you're drawing yourself into that new future. You have now, you have now marked yourself for that, that moment. And so it's just a matter of time. No, I love that. And it's sort of like those good feeling thoughts. So, you know, whatever you're going through in life, find something that makes you feel good. You know, and I remember when my dad died, it was uh, a really, really tough time. But it was even taking my dogs for a walk and stopping to smell roses. There were bushes of roses along my walk every day. And I would even just stop and smell each bush and just, because for me, if my heart feels good and I start to, that's where openings occur. That's mm -hmm. where I can have a shift. That's where transformation is possible mm -hmm. to sort of pull me up and out and, you know, and manifestation, it's such a brilliant game if you get into it. And so, you know, someone like Dr. Joe, I now just think, okay, I've got to really sharpen my skill set, you know. <laughs> I mean, his work is really profound. And, you know, think, I think that um, this is like an out there idea, but I believe that, you know, he's, what he's bringing is special and it's kind of blowing people's minds and it's, seems like from the future, right? It seems crazy. It seems futuristic. It seems like, wow, where'd you come from? How do you get this so well? How do you deliver it so well with such clarity and to be so articulate and relatable and funny along the way? Like, how do you get this information out there like that? And I do believe that all across history, there have been people that have come along that are advanced souls, that are, you know, I don't know, are they channeling, um, you know, other, you know, 
entities and energies in the universe that have information? Are they, are they, uh, what, where is it coming from? Are they a, a very, very sort of evolved soul from a different density? Um, they're light workers. Light workers, like who are these people? But there are people all across history that have come in that have, that seem like they're not from this time. Like they're not working in that sort of like linear sense of like we're here and as a, you know, as a culture, a civilization and a planet, we're evolving slowly. No, there's like these brilliant minds that come here to wake us up all along the way that get it. And, um, and I think Joe's one of those guys. And, you know, in history, there have been, you know, um, people like, uh, you know, Marcus Aurelius or, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Tesla, Nikola Tesla, um, brilliant minds that, you know, were far beyond their point in history. Yeah. Well, now let's get back to you. Um, so talking about, you know, leaving your past in the behind and being present. Being present is, it's, that's a work, a practice every day. How are some of the ways you stay present so that you are open to receive all of this information? Hmm. Creating your environment is super important. So um, actually I interviewed Jay Shetty. It hasn't come out yet, but Jay talked about set, set, it, set setting, sound, and smell. And so that's a great way to just sort of like create your environment. It's like, it's like uh, knowing that crap's going to happen, right? But just doing the best you can to armor up, right? So you create like a beautiful environment for yourself. Burn things that make you smell, what that make you feel good. Play music that makes you happy. Um, making sort of your surroundings really, really ideal um, for the emotion that you want to create. Um, and then I'd say that, you know, something that I've only now just become regular with is meditation. Um, you know, I've probably been re re regularly meditating now for four or five months, most days um, in the morning. And so that's new for me. Um, Do you find it easy? Is it challenging? I think once you, uh, once I uh, got rid of the idea that, that um, it didn't need to be some moment, like I didn't need to astral project just to make, like to tell myself I've had a good meditation. Like I didn't need to have some epiphany or see some vision um, to feel like I had a good meditation. I don't even need to feel like it was a good meditation to have a good meditation. I just need to do it. And so um, even Joe would say that, like, right, he's like, it's all about me meditation for him. And so um, very much about meditation. And, um, you know, not everyone is like the one, but they do happen. And so uh, to me, I look at it like I like I'm visual. And so I think of meditation as like, it's like a roller coaster where, you know, every day, if you can sort of find that sort of space and time to, to meditate, you reset the roller coaster at the bottom. But if you don't reset, then it gets to the top and eventually, boom, you're going over the edge and now you're on the ride, right? Instead of like having control of your emotions, you're hanging on for dear life because you're like, what's coming next? Holy crap. And then you do a loop and, you know, so like the roller coaster of life. So, you know, reset that, you know, reset that ride at the bottom every day as much as you can to you know, keep the emotions under control because we all make better decisions when we're clear, when we're calm, when we're not in some fight, flight, fawn, freeze moment. We, we, um, we, uh, we're able to be rational and um, also feel our bodies. Like, so I think rational obviously is coming from here, but when we, but when we talk about feeling our bodies, then we get in touch with more of like the energetics of things. We get in touch with the frequency of things. We get in touch with our own resonance with that frequency. We then maybe get in touch with um, 
you know, one of those clairs that we might do really well, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, claircognizance, like maybe we get more in touch with one of those, but we can't do that when we're constantly being bombarded and when we're in a state of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, we can't. So I think meditation is really helpful too. And then just, man, take, taking stock of your life. Like, do you like who you're around? Do you like your job? Do you like your coworkers? Do you like, I mean, do you like what you're, what you're purposely, like the surroundings? I think especially friends are the easiest one to decide on because like some, you know, of course we, we need a job, we need to pay bills and things like that, but you don't have to have a friend. <laughs> Get a rescue dog. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have two of them. You heard one bark earlier. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I cuddle with them. We spoon and it's great. Um, but you know, I think taking stock of that and, and even then, you know, on a micro level a little bit too, like your social media and your, you know, things like that, like, who do you follow? What are you looking at? Does it make you feel empowered? Does it make you feel inspired? Does it make you feel positive and hopeful or does it make you feel judgmental? Does it make you feel insecure? Does it make you feel less than, um, you know, so again, it's sort of like assessing all aspects of your life and identifying whether or not they're adding or reducing your well-being. I love all of that. Now you are, you know, through pretty intense, you want to help your audience have breakthroughs. Is this along the lines of the coaching that you would offer? And particularly during COVID, where people are feeling so sort of trapped, isolated, fearful, um, lots of stresses, uh, just trying to get through it. What are some words of wisdom that you would share right now? I understand that that, that others ha- that people have adversity for sure. I've had it. Um, I think asking for help in those moments is really big. And I think if I'm identifying genders a little, girl, women are a little harder to ask for help than men. So, you know, I think just by nature of us being sort of caretakers and doers, multitaskers. We're just um, to you know, but, God forbid we don't. Yeah. So you don't, we don't have to be everything and perfect. We just have to be ourselves. And sometimes we just have to ask for help. So I think that when, you know, when, um, when things get chaotic, asking for help is, um, is something that's really good. And then I would say outside of that, I was thinking about what it was like to, you know, I get asked obviously a lot, what it was like to be a girl in racing and, um, and you know, what was the challenges and the downsides and things like that. And it's like, I chose to focus on the positive. And it is up to you if you do. I could have looked at all the reasons and ways that, you know, it wasn't fair. I didn't get treated the same or this or that. Instead, because everything has its natural balance, instead I chose to focus on the fact that I got attention because I was a girl. I was more attractive to sponsors because I was a girl. When I, you know, had a good race, you know, it would be in the news and you know, even if it wasn't like a win, it would still make the news. Guys didn't get that. So, you know, I I chose to look. I, I had a lot of fans. I was so fortunate. The ones even that booed, I was like, that's just because they're trying to compete with the person next to them that's wearing my T-shirt, you know? Like, so I, I chose to look at all the good sides of things as opposed to, um, as opposed to, how it wasn't fair or what I didn't get. And so mindset, looking at things from a positive perspective of all the things it does bring. And then guess what it does? It brings you more of them and more period. Right. You're in a state yeah. of abundance right. versus a state of lack. You get more versus, and then otherwise you get less. Yeah. No, I'm a big believer in that. Uh, gratitude begets more gratitude. It's like, yeah, it. well, as you know, as Joe would say, gratitude is that perfect state of receiving. I love that. I love it. Okay. So now obviously this wonderful racing career and this incredible podcast, but I'm really interested to know more about Somnium today, um, which is just to let our audience know means Latin for dream. So please share the process of discovering Napa, discovering this vineyard, your love of wine. Um, please tell us all about that. Yeah. Well, it, uh, I guess it started when I lived in England. Um, where are you from? I'm from London originally. Okay, your your accent has definitely like uh, mellowed out quite a bit, but I can tell. Yeah, um, well, and no one understands me here. I've been here sort of a long time anyway, but you know, no one understands what I say if I said, you know, I were to ask for a tuna fish sandwich and a glass of water. 
I'd get laughed out of a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd understand you. Um, so um, it really kind of, I guess, started over there. I, I um, you know, I was of age eventually. And, um, and I just like order a glass of sweet white wine. And then eventually I was drinking some dry white wine. And then, um, then I, you know, came home and sort of like just kept exploring. And then it was on a trip to Napa Valley in 2006, where I was set up for a tasting at a really nice place and there was a big knoll in the middle of the property and i'm standing there at 10 a.m with wine and going wow it'd be really cool to have something like this someday and that's it that was the beginning and so when you think about manifesting i look at how funny it is all these ideas i had and and thoughts become things it's through intention and energy creates matter and so I just thought, wow, how cool would it be to have something like this someday? And then boom, there it is. So two years later, I ended up seeing the property they bought that I ended up buying at the beginning of 2009. And, um, and yeah, it just, it was just a dream of mine that, you know, I was brave enough to allow to become a reality and believe it was possible. So at first I thought to myself, and don't worry about how things tend to come to fruition either because I thought to myself, man, I don't have $50 million to buy a vineyard, like, and to buy a whole thing. And then I ended up realizing through the idea and thought of that being something I wanted that I could do it in a much slower, cheaper fashion. And I could find a piece of land, then I could plant it, then you can farm it. And like, instead of spending 50 million over the course of, you know, you know, in a transaction to acquire something, I realized that, shoot, you could spend 50 million over the course of like 20 years instead. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, you, you, you can do it much slower. And so, so anyway, so I bought the property in 2009, started planting in 11 and, um, yeah. And it's just been this beautiful, fun process that's all about, you know, for me at the core and at the heart of Somnium is really a matter of wanting to help people connect. Because I think that, you know, there's nothing more beautiful and more memorable than those nights when you're sitting there with your friends and your family and you're opening up wine, and you're having such a good time and, you know, you create the memories. And especially at this day and age where, you know, our phones and technology uh, tend to dominate where our eyes are and where our mind is. How beautiful is it to create that environment where we're connecting on a human level and experiencing each other and sharing stories and having fun and, you know, every now and again and getting a little too drunk. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all craving those days. You know? Now, one of the things that most interests me about Somnium is that it's certified organic. So why was that important for you? Uh, well, I, I choose to eat that way anyway. And so, um, you know, very early on asking, um, and, and hiring good people to work, um, work on the project that uphold those same values too, that it's going, that it's going like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was like, we were all, we just had, it was a matter of time. It was already, I guess the point is, is it was already happening. Like it was already being farmed organics, just whether or not we had called someone to sort of make them come out to the property in their, um, whatever their um, certification process is. It's a, it takes two or three years to get the certification because you have to have had um, that long of a record of no pesticides and nothing that's inorganic. So, um, so that's when we finally got it. So it's always been like that, actually. I love that. I really, really love that. It's so important because I think even wine can be, you know, clean now and there's really no excuse to compromise our health or well-being on the planets either you know? i think that we're all realizing that with you know with mont what is it monsanto Mon 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 oh Mon monsanto mm -hmm, with monsanto and all that stuff and just you know where are you know even like how heirloom seeds are becoming kind of manipulated like there's just we just have to be really careful and i hope i mean there's been a lot of changes for sure but i really love the idea that we get back to our own growing and farming and we get our, we have our own little garden at our house. And, you know, I love those pictures that you see on social media where it was like, you know, a front yard that looks like this, but what if it looked like this and, you know, has a bunch of fruits and vegetables and things like that. Like that's beautiful too. I mean, I love gardens personally. So. Do you have a good garden? 
Um, I had one, uh, I had two different ones, um, but I just moved into this house that I'm in recently. And so I don't have a garden here yet and it's in Arizona. So it's like a little tough to have a garden in Arizona. Um, but, uh, having herbs and things like that is still, um, is still totally, totally doable out here. I love that. Now with Somnium, what is your favorite wine? Tell us about your varietals and which one, which one you love most. Well, I love cab. I mean, I love cab. And I think that, I don't know if I'm going to describe what I think the natural sort of evolution of a wine drinker would be. It's like you start with sweet white wine, then it's kind of dry. And then you go to red and it's red, 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 red. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, I want to drink everything now. So I'm at the everything phase. So, um, so I, I think it's for each occasion, there's something it's, you know, champagne has its place. Sparkling has its place. Rosé has its place. White definitely has its place and red. Like there's, there's really, and then within it, there are so many, obviously, you know, depending on what you're eating um, or what you're into, maybe you want something heavier, maybe you want something lighter. Um, but personally, uh, I truly enjoy Cabernet. So, um, so we have a Cab, we have um, a Sauvignon Blanc, and we have a Rosé. Um, so, uh, and they're all incredible. And so, but it started with, it started with the Cab. Yeah, you have Danica Rosé, correct? I do. And then there was, um, then that project launched this year, which is really fun. It's made, it's, it's made in Provence, France. Um, so it's super authentic. It's the home of Rosé. And, uh, and it was really, it's really fun to work on a project that's larger scale. Somnium is so boutique and, um, you know, we sell out of things and we, um, you know, it's also, you know, a higher price point. Um, because of the quality and the, the sort, sort of how long you can, especially cab, how long those, that wine lasts in your, in your cellar um, and the amount that goes into it. Again, it's a boutique. So economies of scale is not in my favor, but quality is essential. So you do things like drop fruit and those kinds of things to make the quality of the wine better, even though you know you're going to make less wine. Um, those are the things that you do when you're looking for quality. Um, and then the rosé project that's in that's grown and bottled in France. That's um, that. It's I mean, mind you, it's, it's it's an incredible wine, but it is definitely scalable. So you know, we uh, we a hundred percent will be. We're already in so many. We're in hundreds of locations already, but just this year already. But um, it will be everywhere um, soon enough. And. Um, and uh, you won't miss it. It's a beautiful bottle with embossed mm-hmm. roses. And, you know, it's a, it's a really, really, really fun project. And so we actually ran this super cool campaign this year that benefited Folds of Honor. We ended up donating over 200. And I think I still have, I still have the um, check here, actually, that I used when we announced it on Fox News. But, um, but we uh, over $250,000 to Folds of Honor through the donations that were made so that people could enroll into the opportunity to go to Monaco for the Monaco Grand Prix next year and um, be our guest on the yacht. So we have a yacht that's in this amazing spot in the, um, in the marina for the Monaco Grand Prix. And it's just going to be the most like fabulous party. So, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it's kind of, I really have to honestly remind myself. I actually don't remind myself. I just laugh and smile that I can't believe I'm working right now. When I hold up a glass of wine and I'm like, am I really working right now? You know, I mean, that's, I think that's, that's a good, that's a good, that's a, that's an amazing place to be. And I'm super grateful. Yeah, and I'm really excited about this Monaco um, Grand Prix party. Who is your favorite Formula One team? Oh, team, I don't know. You know, I don't even watch very much Formula One. I don't even watch much racing anymore, to be honest. I don't even watch much TV. Yeah, I'm a consumer of like, um, of information, of education, um, you know, like what was I watching that was super intellectual the other day? It was, um, let me look at these downloads. It was called the CIA on time travel and the holographic reality. <laughs> like that's the kind of stuff I like reading. I like listening to. Um, but I, I'm just information, right? Just, I, I love, I love learning. And so, um, whether it's a podcast or a story that someone has to share or intellectual information, something that is um, focusing on reality and expansion in the mind, oh, like that's my jam. 
I have an insatiable mind for information. Oh, I love that. It's brilliant. Um, I'm absolutely intrigued by your love of aliens. Can you, can you walk this very sensible English girl through that? Well, I just think it's the idea that, um, I mean, I think it's a naive idea that we, I've been fascinated by the universe since I was a kid. I remember looking up as I was a kid up to the stars and go, it goes forever. It's in forever. And at the end of, what's at the end of forever? Oh my gosh. And it'd give me a headache. And I just thought it was so cool. Um, so I've always been interested in the universe. And, um, and so now, and then actually in grade school, I did a book report on aliens on encounters of aliens of the first, second, and third kind. And I don't think I got to the fourth kind. I think it was the first, second, and third kind. But I did a book report on that when I was a kid in school. And so I've just always been fascinated. I think it's a naive thought that we are the only ones that exist in the universe. Um, I think that, you know, there has to be other things, other energies, and... um, so I'm just fascinated to, to know more and to know the truth. I so deeply seek the, the truth about reality, whether it's someone's opinion of something, whether it's what they want or whether it's whether there's aliens or whether they're lying to us in the government or whatever. Like, I just want to know the truth. And um, that's what makes the podcast fun is because when I interview people, I'm trying to get to their truth. And, um, and I... Uh, I get there sometimes. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> um, sometimes I catch them and they're like, oh. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, it's just a fascination with information and the truth. Yeah, I'm fascinated by, you know, life on other planets. I once uh, remember I was in LA. I hadn't been here very long and I happened to be uh, out for an evening at a bar outdoors and looking up and saw this huge thing move across the sky Really? You know, yeah, it was a very, very, I'll never forget it. It was a, a, a round sort of sphere, sort of an amber color, but it was just, it was illuminated and it was moving across the sky and it wasn't an airplane, it wasn't a satellite, it was, and I was with a friend, a male friend um, at the time and I, and he looked, we were both just, and watched it go over and afterwards we were like, what the hell was that? Because that wasn't, anything that you could possibly put any explanation to any conventional explanation to it was pretty cool you know i sort of, i just don't think that there's any possible way we're the only ones we're the only ones in the universe and um i want to know i just i think that i i think that it would end up leading us to believe that we're so much more alike than we are different and would bring us together more um and um, yeah, I, I believe in frequencies. I believe in dimensions. I believe in, um, I believe in far, far, far more than what we see as our reality in this third dimensional plane of existence. And, um, and, uh, I think that we're on our way. I think that's all the things that have been going so crazy too. I think that's this year and accelerated, I call it accelerated timelines of, you know, rec- realizing sort of truths along the way of, um, you know, the nature of institutions that exist or people and their purpose or um, who they are. Like there's just, you know, we're peeling away the layers and, you know, uh, part of evolving is releasing um, attachment and seeing the truth for what it really is and um, the love and tr- love coming through um, instead of fear winning. I think a lot of people do things out of fear. So. What's your ultimate dream for yourself and your life? Mm. Mm. That can take a lot of different directions. Um, I would say that ultimately it's about how can I get to a state of being that is so joyful all day, every day. Like how close can I get to that? How close can I get to being truly joyful? Like, right, there's a difference between being happy and joyful, right? Happy is like, oh, that's great. And joyful is like, wow, like, oh my gosh, this feels so 
it's like indescribable in words to 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 explain what joy feels like when you just when I'm just walking in the woods with my dogs and I just look and I'm just like wow I feel so small yet so big and so connected and I just feel so much so much heart opening like you were talking about at the beginning and so much so much gratitude and just love and so how do you get to be in that state more often um, I think that that so to to achieve more and more and more of that all the way until the very end is the goal. Um, I think that actually once you get there at all times, I'm pretty sure you evaporate and enter a new dimension. <laughs> Annika, thank you so much. Yeah, all those words you just described, those feelings, I had them when you yeah. just answered my last question and my oh. heart is exploding. I'm in the hugest of gratitude and oh. totally you just connected me. Um, through this oh, I just felt it. Right? That's nice. Yeah. Thank you. My heart is so full right now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. This is a wonderful interview. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too.